Welcome, Melvin. Well, good afternoon. This has already been an exciting afternoon for myself, and when Mark introduced me, I thought that was Stephen Jobs doing the introduction. I was uh, told that um, I could use my own personal journey uh, to talk about uh, some initiatives that resulted in some very significant advances in the healthcare industry. And to do that, I, I must start at a very unique place and time that I found myself in North Carolina, Winston-Salem, North Carolina, to be exact. I was the chief academic officer, the provost and vice chancellor for academic affairs at a very small school, about 2,700 students, located in Winston-Salem that was called Winston-Salem State University. At the same time, I happened to serve on the North Carolina Baptist Hospital Board, and I was chair of the Technology Council. Well, also during that time frame, that area was trying to transform itself from a tobacco-based industry into something that would have taken a tobacco leaf and uh, created a more useful purpose. By the same token, a lot of funding uh, took place in the state of North Carolina as a result of the Golden Leaf Funds. That was the federal suit that came against the tobacco companies, and so therefore there was a large number of funds available for innovation. At the same time, uh, R.J. Reynolds, one large tobacco company, had use for trying to transform some uh, warehousing and other facilities that had purposes in the life sciences. So, with that in mind, the entire state of North Carolina was trying to transform itself into a mecca for biotechnology. So, it brought together some interesting bedfellows. Let's take a look. This is Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Just like Nashville has its Batman building, Winston-Salem has its band roll-on building, if you remember the band deodorants. <laughs> but at the base of that building was an area that uh, was designed specifically for uh, tobacco warehousing and tobacco research, where it provided some wet laboratories that, of course, uh, Wake Forest University was very interested in. They needed room to uh, grow, develop, and to navigate along that line. So in essence, uh, our whole objective was to see if we could turn science into the marketplace. Winston-Salem State University also needed to use wet laboratories for their bioscience uh, laboratory space. And of course, there were a lot of firms that wanted to utilize the innovations coming out of a research park idea. So you see the bedfellows there, Wake Forest University, uh, the School of the Arts, interesting that there's a combination of the arts into the sciences now for design work, Winston-Salem State University, Salem College for Women, and of course, the community college was Forsyth Tech. At the time that North Carolina was trying to transform itself into biotechnology, they needed to transform the entire educational system. So there was a seamless K through 12 emphasis upon science and mathematics, but also Forsyth Tech wanted to develop new programs in biotechnology. And of course, the universities, both Wake Forest and Winston-Salem, was also interested in the fields of biotech. Research parks. Let's take a quick look at some of the advantages of developing them. Well, first, they intended to serve as a seedbed or a catalyst for further innovation. And so you could have an environment, therefore, that business-oriented technology firms could, in fact, develop. But it's an environment that fosters both technology, innovation, but also commercialization. That is the big idea, how to turn this into business activity. But there's also a place where you can create new knowledge. And today's research fosters the university and industry partnerships that are necessary. Let's look at some of the benefits. Of course, the universities are looking for the benefit of financial support. It's uh, quite evident that they're in need of additional resources to further invest in their research and development activities. But also industry. They really uh, benefit by the collaborative work that's being done, but also they can lean upon the expertise that you find within the academic environment. But of course, ben uh, communities benefit from the job creation which is central to this commercialization. But also, the incomes and the resultant tax base that is uh, built upon those uh, income growths 
are something that communities benefit quite well. Uh, this gives you uh, a, a look. If you look at the triangle of how the growth and development takes place, you see at the top you have business and industry. You have also the research environment, education, and they create the strategic partnerships that I'm talking about. It also enriches the entire area of global competitiveness. And I'll show you how some of the firms have uh, located within the research park, have global outreach, and you begin to see what I'm talking about here. Let's look at how the partners interplay. Of course, the public sector, the federal government, state, county, and city, the life sciences development partners that I mentioned earlier in terms of the, uh, the, the research park itself and the universities, private sector companies, some of which are already in existence, but some are also created as a result of working in the park. Business networks, which includes the chamber. I also headed the technology council of the chamber. The work so workforce training and design, that's where your community colleges come into play. And of course, the research partners themselves. What I'm talking about here is an innovation ecosystem. That's what this entire triangle is all about. Now, let's get specific in terms of how this particular research park helped to advance health sciences. You have your medical and biotechnology studies and advanced research, but also cancer research. You also had research in kidney dialysis, neurosciences, nanotechnology, tissue regeneration. I understand the next speaker will talk to you a little bit about that. But in this park, one innovative idea used some technology that, uh, like a regular inkjet printer, could be impregnated with cells. And instead of printing out with ink, cells are printed out to create an environment for the growth and development of new tissue. This type of research is actually being used on the battlefields today of Afghanistan and also Iraq. So we're talking about coming directly from the laboratory right into the, uh, into the hospital uh, beds and right into practical use as far as that is concerned. Another one was in terms of development of new organs. Any organ, like your bladder or kidney or otherwise, could be recreated in the laboratories. And as a matter of fact, I have a friend now that's utilizing one of the bladders that was developed in this research park. What they do is they take engineering, develop the scaffold, and then the cell regeneration takes place around that particular scaffold, and therefore you can create uh, an organ in the, in the body. But business support services, that was also a rich environment to create the kind of support services. And I'm talking about information technology companies and others that were necessary to have that business support, including venture capitalists. They were also created and expanded within this research park idea. That's what I'm talking about in terms of taking the laboratory bench work and bringing it right to the bedside. These are some of the core research activities, clinical design, public health sciences, Structural biology, which I just gave you some quick examples. Tissue reengineering and engineering. I gave you an example there, na nanotechnology. Transgenetic mice development. I saw a human ear actually growing on a laboratory mouse. That is a small miniature example of what an ear looks like. They can actually do this type of science in that research lab. But also biomedical engineering. Now. To show you some of the results, inventions that were disclosed, 59. When we look at US patents issued, eight. Looking at options and license agreements, 13. And I'll show you some of the dollar values associated with the licensing. But also startup companies, four were created right in the park. And of course, here's what I mentioned to you in terms of licensing uh, revenues, a whopping $71 million. When you look at the tenants, I just wanted to show you some of the activities that went on in the park in terms of who were participants. There were 41 tenants, private, university departments, 356 corporate personnel, 468 university personnel. Some jobs were created just for the research park itself, and a total population of 844 people. These are real jobs. And I mentioned to you earlier that I wanted to talk about the global environment and how it impacted upon uh, other companies throughout the world. Here you can see 
five of our seven continents were represented. 25 countries, and you can see them listed. That is what I meant by global outreach. It is North Carolina's largest urban life sciences park. Now, I'm not just trying to suggest that this is the only park. All of you know about the Research Triangle Park. But North Carolina is using this kind of innovative technique to develop an entire network of research parks. And here you see where they're located. This creates jobs across North Carolina. So what is my big idea here? The same kind of activity with the healthcare industry we have even in this local area could in fact be done in this locality. That is the big idea I want you to think about. North Carolina, especially Winston-Salem, touts itself as a place where innovation lives. And I contend that it should not be the only place that innovation lives. Thank you for your time and attention, and I enjoyed talking to you.